we have now our last speaker for uh, today, uh, Danny Andusa. I see he is already here. Good. And I think he already brought uh, also a few friends over from uh, his own channel. Uh, thank you for the raid. <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Joshua, for putting all of this together. Thank you, everybody, who helped organize this. I hope you can hear me right now. Yes. Okay, good. Um, yeah, what an honor to be able to participate in this. I uh, I really appreciate it. What an awesome event. So many cool speakers. It's, again, this is, uh, this is pretty extraordinary. Um, I thought we'd do something a little bit different with, uh, you know, my segment right here. Partly because I had uh, like some major power outages this week, my schedule got all thrown off, and uh, it really wasn't great. Um, but I've got some upcoming research on spinosaurids. I've got a paper that I'm working on with uh, a co-author, and it's something I've been working on for a long time. And I thought it might be a great idea to have kind of a Q&A sort of a session. Nyashu, if you would be open to having kind of a, a back-and-forth discussion about this and also taking questions and comments from chat... Absolutely. Uh, also, I think it'd be if, a great if way to are, kind of present on. I think if I think we can open the stage also a little bit further. If other presenters are here that might have something to contribute to that, uh, or or uh, have uh, see questions before I see them, uh, you are welcome to join. Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, maybe let me give a little bit of background about myself first, oh, just yes. so you kind of know who I am. <laughs> um, I don't like talking about myself, but let's see here. Uh, yeah, I, I work on dinosaurs, kind of functional morphology of dinosaurs. Um, I've done a lot of field work in the Hell Creek Formation and the Judith River Formation with the Museum of the Rockies, with the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Um, I've worked with the Utah Geological Survey last summer out in eastern Utah. Um, dinosaurs are my key research interest, and uh, most of my work so far has been on kind of functional morphology of dinosaurs, trying to figure out what are these different anatomical characteristics that they have? Why did those evolve? What are these animals using those for in their daily lives? And uh, that kind of brings us to spinosaurids. Um, and this project I was worms. working on... Sorry, go ahead. A giant can of worms. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, yes. And given that this is still unpublished, I do have to be a little bit cagey about some of this stuff. Uh... So I can share some of our research, but I can't necessarily share all of our conclusions or, uh, you know, our, our findings until it's actually out there and published. Yeah. But uh, let's see if I can share my screen right here. Let's see if this works. Um, that should be right there. There we go. Uh, so, yeah, um, here's me right here. And there's Dr. Denver Fowler. I uh, hope everybody can see this right now. Oh, it's, it's buffering. Uh, it's buffering. Buffering, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it can take um, a second. Do, 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 okay. Do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, Please work. <laughs> yeah, I told you this. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a change of pace here. Um, I would have loved to have prepared a full SVP style talk for this, but oh boy, uh, power outages will uh, really put the kibosh on that kind of thing. Uh, can you see my screen yet? Tim, Tim, how is it on you on your end? Uh, I, for me, it's still buffering. Hmm. For oh, me, it's also still buffering. May have just come up. Weird. May maybe restart uh, screen <clears throat> share. Sure. Yeah. Sometimes it needs a second. I will. Uh, Let's see here. I will be here to toss through questions uh, from the chat. Yes. Yeah. Go for it. Ah, there we go. Now it works. Excellent. Okay. All of that for just a little photo like this. Anyway, <laughs> here is, uh, is me right there uh, with the orange uh, uh, kefaya. There's Denver Fowler. Uh, yeah. Um, dinosaur paleontologist at the Badlands Dinosaur Museum in North Dakota. If anybody ever happens to find themselves in the state of North Dakota, make sure you visit that museum. Uh, here's Denver's uh, father, Warwick Fowler, who would join us in the field. Work unfortunately um, passed away uh, recently, um, but yeah, he was a uh, kind of a, a living legend in um, amateur British paleontology, at least as I understand it. Uh, 
And here's Jack Wilson right here, for whom Despletosaurus Wilson I is named after. Uh, ah. A lot of people might be familiar with this new taxon. That's Jack right there. Um, yeah, so this is us together in 2015. And Denver Fowler really kind of came up with the idea for this project. Some of you might already be familiar with his uh, Predatory Ecology of Deinonychus paper. Which I'll see if I can pull that up right here. If it will... Let's see, change windows. There we go. Let's try for that. Uh, yes. I can just abandon this altogether. The uh, Is it up? Yep. Excellent. Great. Uh, so the raptor prey restraint model for dromaeosaur, uh, like a stability flapping, that was Denver's idea. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, I think it was in about 2012. Uh, there we go. Denver approached me and he said, Danny, I've got a potential project that you might be interested in. It's on spinosaurids. Um, Denver, of course, is from the north of England. Uh, Baryonyx is one of the most well-preserved and that's most well-known dinosaurs from England, at least in terms of its completeness. And uh, yeah, we uh, we decided to go back and look at some of the original publications on Baryonyx and then kind of grab some low-hanging research fruit. There were some ideas that were brought up in a paper early on, but we wanted to kind of test to see if if they actually stand up to scrutiny. Um, it was kind of the, the impetus for the project there. And uh, I'm f glad to finally be on the verge of, of publishing this thing pretty soon. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. We should ask if anybody's got any questions in the chat, first there of all, is, I think. Uh, there is already uh, a question here. Um, Brilliant. Um, I will read this. It's by Petit here. How do we, you recommend we illustrate the way Spinosaurus move through the water? Surface swimming, hippo Ooh. power walking, or swimming in the water column? At is an excellent question. That's something we actually touch on in this project. Um, <laughs> we all know that Spinosaurids are controversial, especially uh, the genus Spinosaurus itself from North Africa. Whatever it been... is. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Holy cow, Yashua, you, you well know. I saw your uh, We Don't Talk About Spino video the other day, and that really gave me a chuckle. That was, uh, that was pretty brilliant. Yeah, and yeah. Kind of I, I mean, credit has how... to go for, to to Rick Raptor for putting together the lyrics, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, kudos to Rick Raptor. Holy cow! Uh, excellent stuff. It's become basically a meme at this point. Uh, what was Spinosaurus doing? Our project focuses maybe a little bit more on Baryonychine Spinosaurus, like Baryonyx, Suchomimus, those ones, just to try and kind of sidestep all of the Spinosaurus controversy, although there are definitely still implications for Spinosaurus. We are of the opinion right now that these animals weren't subaqueous pursuit predators. These things were not, as far as we know, chasing fish actively through the water like uh, you know, an otter or something like that. Uh, it would have been a little bit more almost kind of between like a heron and a hippo. Uh, kind of wading predators, maybe submerging themselves up to about belly deep. Uh, various lines of evidence, including like Emiot et al.'s 2010 paper on isotopic stuff, show that these animals were probably at least semi-aquatic. That's what the isotopes seem to show. Um, so it's not like these animals were not going into the water, but, you know, it's more like they were kind of wading in belly deep and uh, kind of doing something along the lines of like, oh, I could show you later. <laughs> I've got some illustrations I best, I, bet, I guess I could show you. Uh, I could show you some of the results from this. But um, yeah, we think that they're, they're almost kind of in between, say, like what a grizzly bear is doing in catching fish and like a gharial, like a uh, slender snouted fish eating crocodile. Ah. Um, yeah, I can show you that in a minute if we can get the uh, the stuff to load properly. Something that, that I like to a... oh yeah, Tim, go ahead, Josh. Uh, something that I like to to do with with spinosaurs, especially compared to polar bears. Mm -hmm. Although living in a tropical environment, <laughs> like a polar bear going from uh, iceberg to iceberg, uh, and and mm -hmm. uh, similar, to, uh, and I imagine like uh, and then from the from the water's edge going going after pinnipeds and. 
and whales, uh, stuff like that. Similar to, we probably had this big mangrove system in Northern Africa where spinosaurids, how many there might be, <laughs> grabbed stuff uh, with their <laughs> exactly, teeth how or, many taxa. or, or uh, claws from the water. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that is kind of consistent with our findings so far. Um, yeah, it's... This is a really tricky group to work on because the material is so incredibly sparse. Um, yeah. yeah, but there were some recent papers that came out uh, that we cite in our paper talking about buoyancy in, in spinosaurids. Um, it seems like the more people study this, despite some apparent pachystosis in the bones, some thickening of the bone walls in order to make them more dense, these animals still would have been pretty buoyant. They're still kind of dealing with that natural theropod buoyancy. It's yeah. just kind of, you know, a synapomorphy of the whole group. They've got air sacs and hollows through their skeleton. These would have been, you know, not nearly as pronounced in spinosaurids, but they still have that. Um, and maybe they're evolving toward being able to, uh, you know, be sub subaqueous predators pursuing fish actively in the manner of a gharial or something like that. But, uh, yeah, they're, they certainly don't seem to be there yet by the time they go extinct. Like yeah, what, what, that's, that's an interesting question for, for Spec Evo. What would have happened if they mm -hmm. didn't go extinct uh, towards the middle of the Cretaceous there? Like, what would have happened Absolutely. if they had uh, persisted mm -hmm. until the end of the Cretaceous or beyond? Absolutely, yeah. And that's another thing that I wonder about also. What do these environments look like to be able to allow several large piscivorous animals to all coexist? True in the same environment. Because Spinosaurids are living alongside crocodilians, some of them most obscenely large. Um, how in the world are these animals able to uh, to get along with them? Are there that yeah. many fishes around here? Were sea levels this high that, you know, you would have had all of these low-lying coastal areas just inundated and there's just scads and scads of habitat for everybody? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Tim, do you yeah. have uh, a question? Otherwise, I found one. Uh, there was a question in chat um, about Spinosaurus proper and its short legs. Mm -hmm. uh, were Spinosaurus yeah. short legs uh, likely an adaptation for better swimming? I'm not necessarily convinced that these animals were swimming full time to make a living. Um, we kind of envision them more as wading predators, and we get into this in the paper extensively. Um, but I think one thing that... I guess I can kind of give this away right now. Um, Spinosaurids in general seem to have fairly short hind limbs. This yeah. is not something that's necessarily unique to Spinosaurus. Spinosaurus might take it to an extreme. Again, we need more fossils to kind of test that hypothesis, figure out actually what's going on anatomically with that animal because it's essentially a chimera right now. Uh, it just, it appears to be probably several different spinosaurids kind of mixed together. Um, but one of the things that we found that had been overlooked is that back in uh, Cherrigan Milner's papers on baryonyx, uh, they actually had to estimate the length of the femur. Uh, I think part of it was destroyed in the, the quarry either before or maybe during excavation. Um, they were working in some pretty rough conditions up there and the femur the mid shaft just was destroyed and so they had to estimate how long the femur was and uh most of the reconstructions that you see of baryonyx they kind of take for granted that it had a sort of typical you know, large theropod length femur yeah but when you look at the only spinosaurid to my knowledge that has a complete uh femur and a humerus to compare it to that ratio is going to be important in a minute when you look at Suchomimus from Niger, this animal had a fairly short femur. And actually, it often gets reconstructed uh, with a femur longer than, uh, than the figures that they give in the paper for the length of the femur. And uh, I'm sure a lot of you, uh, especially who have been around for a while and you've seen older reconstructions of baryonyx, uh, you've seen sort of semi-quadrupedal reconstructions. Joshua, you... Sure, you've seen uh, a great number of these before. Oh, uh, uh, way too many. 
Uh, actually, quick question. Uh, so that's uh, a, an idea that Cherrigan Milner actually brought up back in the 80s. Yeah, 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 um, I remember that. And then they later kind of... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, I remember that, but a uh, quick quick question. Uh, since you brought up uh, Baryonyx, sure. I guess uh, you mentioned uh, Baryonyx in your paper too. Were you able to access uh, Baryonyx, uh, not Baryonyx, uh, Sucubimus material for this? No, so most of our, our work has actually been literature-based for this. Ah, okay. um, yeah. I should maybe explain kind of our methodology for this, first of all. Um, so yeah, spinosaurid material, as we all know, is extraordinarily rare, and we don't have any of it from North America yet. I'm based in the United States, uh, so is Denver Fowler. Um, but we recognized that there was something kind of fishy going on with uh, reconstructions of spinosaurid fishing behavior, hmm. and uh, we decided to look through the literature and then look for any mentions of fishing behavior that's proposed in any of these papers. Oh, they were fishing like grizzly bears, or they were fishing like herons, they were doing this, they were doing that. And we decided to actually do a like comprehensive review of, uh, of fish-eating tetrapods um, and to try and find a good analog for spinosaurids. And it's difficult because they are unlike any other modern fish-eating tetrapod. Uh, they've got this bizarre suite of different adaptations that's... Uh, yeah, nobody else has got. Uh, and so, yeah, we uh, we looked... We, this is kind of a combination of, like, a literature review and looking at extant animals to figure out how they uh, actually catch fishes, usually either using their jaws or using their claws, um, which has been proposed for spinosaurids. So it's... Pattern. Yeah, a lot of comparative functional morphology, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um... And I don't think any of our findings are going to be... I don't think it's going to be particularly shocking. There's going to be a lot of kind of aha moments like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. But uh, there's some interesting things that I think we're going to try and dispel. Uh, yeah, yeah, stay tuned for the paper. I need I'm going to get this thing published before I leave for the summer in June for fieldwork. I have to have it uh, submitted yeah. for publication before then. So uh, really looking forward to that. Yeah. Do yeah. I have another question? Uh, Oh sure, yeah, go for it. Uh, Tim, there do, are do, do we have another one? Chat. Um, let me see. Uh, a lot of questions on Spinosaurus proper. If you're uh, okay with taking those. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I'm totally fine. Yeah. Vasi is asking for your opinion on the amount of Spinosaurids that we have from North Africa. That's an excellent question, and that's one that I can't talk with any kind of authority on, unfortunately. Um, it seems like, I think there's a growing consensus that uh, the Spinosaurus model, the one that was on the cover of National Geographic, or you know, this one that's become really popular of like the, you know, subaqueous pursuit predator Spinosaurus, uh, that is probably an amalgam of several different Spinosaurids kind of mixed together. Yeah. Um, but again, it's really difficult to say. But we're... It's an uphill battle trying to figure out uh, what these animals looked like because we have so little material. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but we certainly do have. Uh, it seems like we've got multiple Spinosaurid taxa. How they line up stratigraphically uh, in the time of Spinosaurus? Like, are, do, are are we looking at an anagenetic lineage here? Are we looking at different Spinosaurid groups? What is ontogeny? What role does ontogeny play in all of this also? Um, and geography, yeah, these too. These are all really complicating factors. Geography, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, like, there was I'm this paper so, that just came out recently. I'm so pleased uh, that that slowly the, the Egyptians are building up their own paleontological program and go back to Baharia to absolutely. look at what, what Stroma left behind, basically. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. This summer, I was lucky enough to work with an Egyptian paleontologist, ah, uh, nice. Bilal Salem. He came out to, uh, ah, to Utah yes. to yeah. uh, oh, awesome. to dig with us, and uh, yeah, it's it was, it's really exciting to hear about the progress that they're making there in kind of uh, taking hold of their paleontological heritage and and building different programs and uh, it's it's wonderful. I love to hear about it. Yeah. Um, um, let's see. The 
got yeah. some more questions. Yeah. Let, let me expand a little bit, maybe, before we get into another question on the sure. hind limbs thing, like we were talking about, because uh, this is something that I think uh, it's got certain relevance for people who like to reconstruct Spinosaurids. If you love to draw Spinosaurids, this you know, might be right up your alley. Um, I was talking about the the kind of semi-quadrupedal hypothesis that Cherrigan Milner put out back in 1983. Um, you know, I've got like a plastic model right here that I could show off. Uh, you know, we've all seen this kind of quadrupedal model of Baryonyx. It's kind of got a fish under its claw right there. Yeah. Uh, the super robust forelimbs of Spinosaurids are something that people have talked about, but we don't really have like a, a strong adaptational hypothesis for what they were actually using those strong forelimbs for. Why do they have these super, super robust humeri and really robust radius and ulna as well? Um, given these animals do seem to have actually had shorter hind limbs, um, they very well... Uh, the the forelimbs might play a strong role in feeding, either in actually prey capture or maybe just kind of resting on the forelimbs in order to bring their snout kind of closer down to the, the substrate uh, when they're trying to catch fishes. And that's something that we talk about in our paper here. Yeah. Or um, something is, is that, that are by, uh, came to my mind looking recently at some Brazilian material, um, mm -hmm. just uh, prey transport. Because many Sorry, of these prey... Uh, prey transport, because uh, some of these spinosaur, ah. um, more derived spinosaur claws we have aren't really that curved. They are not really these typical meat mm -hmm. hooks you would expect, but the fingers are still quite long. So right. they were probably, yeah. so, so I could imagine them, okay, I just caught this thing. There's a bunch of sharks <laughs> coming in for, into the shallow water where I caught it bring it onto uh -huh. land and also it's closer to the center of mass uh uh than, sure. than in my my snout because uh okay yeah the, the torso is quite long uh don't want to fall mm. over very long in dinosaurs yeah. yeah yeah um that is something that i should explore a little bit uh one of our hypotheses for what they're using the claws for does kind of deal with this um yeah big hooked claws like that you know in a previous paper, Denver was looking at, uh, at different birds of prey and what they used their claws for. Uh, he was measuring curvature. He was measuring yeah. you know, how large the claws, claws are in relation to the phalanges, um, all kinds of stuff like this. And uh, we didn't quite go in that depth with, into the, that same depth of detail with Spinosaurids. But we're... Uh, yeah, there's, there's definitely a common theme there. I could... I guess I can talk about this right here. Um, one of the things that Cherrigan Milner uh, kind of proposed back in 1983 that becomes kind of a meme in paleo art, even back in the 1980s and through the 1990s and 2000s, is that these animals were kind of, you know, skewering fish with their claws and then maybe dragging them up onto land or something like that. Um, but yeah, they keep bringing up this idea of kind of gaffing fish out of the water. Uh, and they say, this is a behavior that's analogous to grizzly bears today. They say, oh, yes, grizzly bears, they catch fishes, obviously. Um, up in Alaska, there are grizzly bear populations where, for a good part of the year, they're mostly eating salmon. That's where most of their calories come from. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, just like grizzly bears will hook fish out of the water with their claws, maybe Baryonyx was using its enormous claws and its robust forelimbs for the same thing. But there's an issue with this idea. And... Uh, some people have probably uh, picked up on this already. Grizzly bears don't actually do that. <laughs> yeah. um, when grizzly bears fish, they don't actually hook fish with their claws. They don't gaff them out of the water. They don't flip them out of the water. Um, and so we were looking at some studies on how grizzly bears actually catch fishes in the first place. What are the methods that they employ with these big forelimbs and those big claws that they have? And uh, yeah, gaffing or hooking, not a thing that they actually do. So using... Uh, bears is an analogy for spinosaurids to propose this behavior. You know, it, it just doesn't follow. Um, yeah, at least in that so yeah, aspect. Yeah, we, we looked at yeah. what grizzly bears actually do. So, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, at least in that uh, in that aspect of of their behavior mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when we were looking at spinosaurids like this, um, 
we had to kind of create a short list of different modern tetrapods to compare them to. And grizzly bears made that list. Uh, they're one of very few, like, kind of large tetrapods with claws that are mostly terrestrial that feed on fishes. Um, so we try to figure out how do grizzly bears actually catch fish. And it's tricky because grizzly bears are not, they don't actually have any strong morphological adaptations uh, for piscivory. In fact, like the majority of grizzly bears don't actually go out and catch fish. It's actually like a cultural practice among ground bears. Yeah. Okay, grizzly bears. There's only certain populations that do it and they teach their young how to do this. So it's not like they're strong, you know, uh, evolutionary constraints. It's not like they're being actively selected for larger claws or longer snouts yeah. or anything like that, like we see in Spinosaurids. Um, but they can still offer some insight into how do you use claws and big forelimbs in order to catch fish. And, uh, yeah, I, anybody who's watched grizzly bears do this in the wild, knows they usually have got two methods for, uh, for catching fishes. One is just to grab them with your snout and, you know, <laughs> grizzly bears aren't specially adapted for this sort of thing, so sometimes it's a little bit messy. But the other thing that's maybe a little bit more um, uh, precise, I guess, is, uh, especially like more experienced bears will do this, uh, is they'll stamp on fishes with their forelimbs, and they'll use those claws to hold this wriggling fish against the substrate, uh, and then they can pick it up with their mouth, and they can pull it over to the bank, and they can eat it. Um, yeah, and this sort of method, we think... It makes a lot of sense for spinosaurids. Uh, it helps explain the short hind limbs, the long forelimbs that are very powerful. They almost seem like they'd be well adapted for weight bearing. Um, not for locomotion, but if they're stamping down on, on fishes with these claws, then suddenly all of these different anatomical characteristics start to kind of come together and make sense in a way that is really tricky to do for spinosaurids. Yeah. Does that uh make sense? For, yeah, yeah, no, no, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you on that. Usually, uh, one question that that comes to mind uh, for me is, mm -hmm. um, do we see enough flexibility in the arms to do this kind of uh, motion for for stomping? Um, that is an excellent question. Here, can I? Uh, let me see if I can share my screen yeah. because also, I've got a draft have you seen the new uh, the new Spanish Spinosaur with an excellent preserved arm that is being worked on right now? I am very excited about that, and I'm really, really hoping that they've got some kind of carpal material in there. Yes. You know, wrist yes. material from these animals, because that would uh, that would help either confirm or falsify this hypothesis. Yeah. Um, could they actually pronate their wrists, or are they doing something kind of different? You know, what kind of range of motion do you have in the forelimbs like that uh, that would either allow for this or or not? Here, let's try to share this right now. Let's see if that comes up. Yep. Um, and I've got a poor little coelacanth right there. Oh, well, big coelacanth. And this is supposed to be baryonyx. It's this all illustration relative. Years and years ago. But, uh, sorry, say again? It's it's all relative, big and large in this case. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, this is a behavior that we see not only in grizzly bears, but other fish-eating tetrapods that use their claws to catch fishes. It's interesting, like, we look at different groups of animals. So, like, uh, we've got bears, we've got fishing cats and flat-headed cats. And, you know, of course, these are all carnivorous mammals. So you're dealing with some level of, like, homology, the same kind of basic body plan there. But um, there's some evolutionary distance between them. And they've, you know, both kind of hit upon the same prey capture method uh, when they're catching fishes. They use those clawed forelimbs to pin them to the river or lake bottom. Um, and then they pick them up with the jaws. Yeah. And, uh Yeah. Yeah. So it again we're we've got kind of a dearth of of good creatures to compare spinosaurids to because there are very few, you know, fish eating tetrapods that kind of ambush fishes. Um although there is another one that gets discussed quite a bit, and uh that is herons, and I can talk a little bit about them also. Uh unless somebody's got a pressing burning question right now. Uh, so there are in which some case we can chat. Uh, maybe we All right, can do great. some of these uh, in quick fire. Sure thing, yeah. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, we are also slowly uh, running out of time, actually. We are already in the information. Yeah, of that. Already. 
Uh, Holy cow. Do you think <laughs> Spinosaurids like Baryonyx and Sukumimus could still hunt down smaller dinosaurs? I can't see why not. Yeah, I, we do think that they... There's multiple lines of evidence that these were fairly versatile in their diet. You know, we've got evidence of Spinosaurids eating pterosaurs. We've got that tooth embe embedded in a pterosaur vertebra. True. We've yeah. got potential young Iguanodontian bones in the, the belly of the holotype Baryonyx. So yeah, these guys are probably... They're not exclusively eating fishes, by any means. No. Uh, then the next one. As for the robust forelimbs, would, the poss mm -hmm. would these possibly be used in interspecific combat? Maybe similar to Varanids? That's an interesting idea, yeah. Um, I'm not sure how you'd go about testing that. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, so many different anatomical characteristics in animals are used for a, a myriad of different purposes. But yeah, Hone and Holtz, in their paper uh, pretty recently, they say that maybe those forelimbs are so robust because they would have used, been used for kind of digging, either digging out nests or maybe one can imagine them digging out channels um, for fishes to swim through in a mangrove environment or something like that. Uh, yeah, but whether that would have a, uh, like that kind of behavior would put such constraint on them that they would evolve huge beefy forelimbs like this. I don't know. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, yeah. Then we have I think one last one. question and then we have to wrap it up because I think yeah. we, we all need a little little getting something to drink and, uh, and uh, toilet Certainly. rest uh, before we go into our yeah. last point of the day. Yes. Uh, then if you're uh, if you want, of course, you could also uh, answer the questions in the chat yourself. After we're done with yep. our little talk here. Um, sure what seems to be quite common is uh, people are asking for your opinion on Sereno et al. 2022. So the uh, leg bone density paper. And right. uh, what, what impact that would have. Yeah, yeah. it's It does present kind of a quandary. So uh, in that paper, they suggest that there's strong pachystosis in these animals. That they've got, like, you know, a lot of bone ballast. Uh the bones would have been really, really heavy, and that may have made them less buoyant so that they could swim under the water. But then other papers are saying, you know, other researchers, Henderson et al., and um, you know, they say that these animals would have been far too buoyant anyway, so they're not actually swimming under the water. However this turns out to be, um, I don't know, our hypothesis that these animals are basically like kind of wading into the water belly deep, maybe they're kind of standing against flowing water, either flowing from the tides or mouth of a river, an estuary, something like that. Um, it kind of works with our model either way, so I'm not super worried about it. Um, uh, yeah, and there's been a, a surprising amount of controversy, I think, about bone density here. It's not something that I've done a lot of work in, and my opinion isn't going to be worth very much on that. Um, but yeah, maybe these animals are evolving denser bones in order to uh, to make them better waders, or maybe they are subaqueous, or I don't know. But uh, yeah, we talk about this in our paper, and I can't give away too much of that just yet. But uh, kind of our hypothesis is almost kind of a nice little middle ground between a more terrestrial spinosaurid and something that's, you know, actively pursuing prey under the surface of the water. Okay. I think that was a good closing question there. Um... Daddy, thank you very much for being here. This was a nice little discussion to have. Uh, if there are yeah, any more questions, so uh, I, I think at least a few uh, Daddy can also uh, answer in, in text form in uh, the questions and answers uh, channel. Uh, other than that, I have now a little uh, pause. I would say five minutes uh, before we go into uh, our next point, which is uh, the QBs.